Um, welcome, everybody. My name's Dave Binks. I'm the admissions tutor for the physics programs here in Manchester. Uh, welcome to the open day. Welcome to Manchester. Um, so you guys, uh, or at least the 16 and 17 year olds amongst you, are in the process of making what is probably one of the most difficult and important decisions you've ever had to make, which is what and where to study at university. Now, not only is it difficult and important, it's also personal. So what the right answer for you is not necessarily the right answer for the next person, okay? But what is true, is true for everybody, is that the more information that you have, the more likely you are to make the right decision for you as an individual. So the purpose of days like today is, and it's just a start of the journey, is for us to help you with that process, okay, by giving you as much information as we can about the physics programs here in Manchester. So that means what exactly it is you'll be studying uh, when you come to study physics, how, what the syllabus will be like, what the options are like, how you'll be taught, and also what sort of things you can do when you graduate, okay? I'll uh, try and cover as much of that as I can today, but that's not the only way we're gonna help you today. The other way is to give you uh, experience the place you'll be studying, perhaps, okay? So I encourage you to go on the lab tours. Okay? They run on a rolling basis all day. They take about half an hour. And there you'll get a chance to see the labs and the other teaching spaces over in the physics building. That's under the Shuster building, okay? Uh, so you can go there af after this talk, for instance. It's also an important experience for you to get a feel for what it's like to study physics here in Manchester. You might be spending three or four years of your life here, so you need to know it's right for you as an individual. So can you imagine yourself sat in lecture theatre like this? Could you imagine yourself uh, working in one of the labs that, we'll sh that you can see later, or studying in one of the tutorial rooms? Okay. It's an important decision, so take your time and get a feel for the place, as well as looking at just the details of the programmes and, the, uh, and how we teach. Okay. So the first question I'm going to try to answer for you is what is physics at university level? You've already been, you're already doing A-level physics now, so you're spending maybe 25% of your time studying it for two years, so you already know quite a lot, but if you come to university, you're spending three or four years and 100% of your time studying physics. So you get to know it in a lot more detail, okay, and a lot more breadth, okay. So what is physics? What are we talking about when we talk about physics at university level? Uh, it's a big question. It's actually an easy answer. Physics is about everything. <laughs> and literally, I mean everything, okay? It includes the study of the universe as a whole, cosmology. So when I say it's everything, it's literally everything, okay? But it's not just cosmology. It's actually studying the world, how the universe works, every possible length scale, okay? So we study uh, the universe as a whole, and we study galaxies and stars and planets on huge astrophysical uh, scales. We also study physics on the everyday scale that we all experience, okay? And on scales much, much smaller in terms of atoms and nuclei, right down to the fundamental building blocks that the universe is made of. We study all that. I mean, if you think about it for a second, it's ridiculous, it's ambition, but it's also amazing in its success. We uh, can describe the universe at almost every possible level down to fundamental concepts. So that, in essence, what physics is about, but it's not just that either. Physics is about understanding the world at all possible scales on a very fundamental level, but it's also about using that knowledge, that understanding, to do useful things. So physics is also about applying our understanding of the world to do, make new technologies. So here are a few examples, uh, and there are many more, we have things like uh, nuclear reactors and body scanners and microchips and LEDs and smoke detectors and lasers. Uh, we have even new stuff. I don't know if anybody recognizes this. This is a diagram of some graphene. Graphene is this single atom layer of carbon, which is the strongest, most conductive material ever discovered. And obviously, I bring it up because we discovered here in Manchester okay, in 2004 and the discoverer has got the Nobel Prize for that in 2010. And as you'll see uh, when you go around on the lab tour, that this is a great illustration of one of the benefits of coming to study at a research university like Manchester, is you'll see that we use the results of the latest research into the teaching, both in the lab and the lectures. 
Okay, so you'll see how our students are using graphene in their lab. Okay, so physics is about understanding the world at this very fundamental um, level with the greatest possible scope, okay, and using that knowledge and understanding to do useful things. But it's more than that again. It's not just about uh, understanding a set of facts about the world. It's in a way you approach a problem, a way you understand how the world works in different ways and apply that knowledge to useful things. So, a good example of what I mean there is this. This, if you're an economist, will be very famous. This is the Skolls Black Equation. It won the Nobel Prize for Skolls Black and Merton um, back in 97, I think it was. But they didn't get the Nobel Prize for physics. They didn't get the Nobel Prize even for chemistry. They got the Nobel Prize for economics. But that's a physics equation. That equation originally came from a description of diffusion. Diffusion is the process by which if I open a bottle of smelling salts over here, the smell spreads to the roof. Okay, that's diffusion. Skulls and Black applied that idea, applied the methods and approaches of physics to the diffusion of money through the economy. Okay, and for that, they got the Nobel Prize. So this is an illustration of physics not just as a set of facts about the world, but in an approach, in a way of analysing and tackling problems that's incredibly powerful. It can be applied in very useful and unexpected ways sometimes. So that's what physics is about. Uh, so, but physics is not just a set of knowledge uh, that is fixed. Physics is something you learn how to do. Okay? It's a set of skills. Okay? that you learn when you learn how to do physics and you can apply to do physics or you can apply in other areas as well. So what are the skills uh, you need or do you learn while doing physics? Well, to do physics, uh, well, physics is science. Physics uh, learns about the world through experiment, okay? So you design and build and uh, perform new experiments, okay? Now, the results of those experiments are usually numerical data. Now, that on its own is meaningless. It's just a set of numbers. To draw meaning from that, to make decisions and draw understanding from it, you need to analyze it and interpret it. Okay? Now, those are the important skills you learn in physics, but they are highly transferable. You can use the same skills to analyze and understand any numerical data, whether it be stock market data or a business spreadsheet or whatever it could be. Now, then once you've got a result from your experiment, you have to, it's not done in isolation. You then have to compare that to what's already known. Okay? So physics, science is a cumulative process. We build on what's gone before. So you have to compare what is existing knowledge to what you found. And does it agree? Okay? If not, why not? Did you make a mistake? Or have you found something new? Okay? So that's important as well. Now, maybe you have found something new, okay? You've added to knowledge by this process. Now, that would be entirely useless if you did then lock that away in a desk drawer, okay? So then the next stage is you've got to tell the world about it. You've got to disseminate that knowledge. You do it either uh, orally, by giving talks at conferences or in lectures, or by the written word, by writing pa papers and books, okay? So a, a key skill of a physicist is communication communicating what you've done and what you've learned. And the other key skill is that these days, um, science is expensive to do on the whole, okay? If you're building experiments, equipment needs buying, people, research assistants need paying, there's usually a team of people involved. So you, gone are the days when you would be some gentleman scientist who just did something in his basement. It's now an enterprise where you need to persuade somebody Quite often, for instance, the, uh, the government to spend money on what you want to do. You need to persuade people that what you want to do is worthwhile, is worth spending taxpayers' money on. So you'd have to learn how to persuade, okay? Persuade people to part with the money, that you're, what you want to do is worthwhile. Cool. So that's what's involved in doing physics, which means the skills that you acquire when you learn how to do physics, okay? And that's the part of the process of studying for a degree is you have to have an inquiring, creative, critical mind. 
Okay? You have to apply reason and logic. Now, physics is a great teacher of how to think in a very robust, rigorous way. Okay? Mother Nature, she doesn't care how clever you think you are. Mother Nature doesn't care how beautiful you think your equations are. Mother Nature doesn't care what you want to be true. Mother Nature just cares what is. Right? So if you practice your reasoning and your logic against Mother Nature, she'll teach you well. Okay? You can apply that in lots of other ways. As I said before, because experimental data is usually numerical, you have to learn how to understand and interpret and analyze numerical data. And that's a key skill that can be applied in many different areas. And then, these days, very often scientists don't work alone, okay? You usually work in a group, in a team. So you need to learn how to manage people and work with people. And the science that we do is, by its very definition, new, okay? We're trying to do things that haven't been done before, okay? And that means, the chances are, the first time you build your experiment and do it, it won't work. Okay? It's not been done before. It'll be something you haven't thought of. So you've got to make it work. You've got to learn how to solve problems. Okay? So all these are incredibly valuable skills. And then you've got to communicate it to the world. So all these things are what you learn when you learn how to do physics. Okay? And they can be applied within physics or they can be applied a whole host of different ways, as we'll talk about later. Okay, so that's general comments about what physics is like at university. What's physics like uh, here in Manchester? So, uh, very much the home of physics is the Shuster building, the Shuster lab, okay? So, that's just uh, maybe 100 yards down Brunswick Park from here. So, if you want to go on the lab tours, that's where they'll be. That's where we have the vast majority of our offices, our labs, and our lecture theatres, okay? Uh, Physics has been done in Manchester uh, for about 150 years or so. And during that time, we've had no fewer than 13 Nobel Prize winners associated with us as either staff or students. So they include people like uh, Rutherford here. He got the Nobel Prize for being the first person to split the atom here in Manchester. And they run all the way up to our two most recent Nobel Prize winners, uh, Andrei Gaim and Kostya Novotilov for the discovery of, of graphene. Okay. Uh, another aspect that's very hot off the press is what's known as the REF exercise. REF stands for Research Excellence Framework. It's a, a process uh, undertaken by the UK government to assess the research carried out at every university department uh, in the country. Uh, and in physics, Manchester is top. Okay, for the quality of the research as assessed by the UK government. Okay, so why is that important from a student's point of view? Why is it important what the research is like? Well, one of the benefits of coming to study in a research university, as I mentioned before, with graphene as an example, is you get to that quick feed through from the research into the teaching. You get to learn of the people making the latest discoveries. Okay, so that's the importance of research. Okay, so what's the department like? It's a uh, large-ish, not, not the largest, but the largish physics department. We have about 90 academics. That's, academic means either lecturer or professor. Uh, so the ones who, who do the teaching. Uh, and supporting them, we have over 200 uh, research assistants and admin staff. And uh, we have about 330 new undergraduates joining us every year. Okay. So that means we have about uh, 1,200 students altogether in all four years. Uh, and then about 70 new postgrads on top of that every year. So we're a big department, uh, not the biggest, but one of the biggest. Uh, and that means we have a lot of staff, which we can mean that those staff encompass a lot of expertise covering the full spectrum of physics disciplines. So this is a benefit of a big department, is that whatever bit of physics you discover that you're interested in, we've got an expert in that field who delivers a course on it, okay? So that's a benefit of coming to a big department. Uh, in terms, that's about the people. In terms of bricks and mortar, this is the Schust lab I mentioned before, which is the main uh, center for physics. 
Uh, you'll notice on the lab tour, we'll take you around our undergraduate labs, which uh, many of which are now placed in the new annex. This is a 10 million pound uh, uh, annex built a few years ago, which shows the investment Manchester's placing in, the, in physics teaching. Uh, and also, because we've outgrown the Shust a little bit, many of our, uh, some of our staff are in the next building, and Turing building, uh, particularly the astronomers. Okay, so that's about the physics department in general, but what about the different programs that we offer? So we offer uh, a range of programs. We have physics, okay, uh, and we have these programs physics with, so physics with astro, physics with theory, physics with study in Europe. Uh, those are, uh, uh, if you like, a, a major and a minor topic, and then we also have maths and physics, which is a 50-50 split. That's a joint honours, okay? Most of them are available either as a three-year bachelor's or the four-year MPhys. The exception is the physics we study in Europe. That's because that's a four-year, has to be a four-year program because year three is spent studying abroad uh, at a part university in, in Europe, okay? However, you don't really have to make a final decision about that until you arrive, regardless of what you eventually put on UCAS form, okay? Uh, the entry requirements are identical. There's no, um, no quotas for, for recruitment to any of them, okay? So it doesn't really matter what you put on the, for, uh, on the form, okay? You can, on day one, when you arrive with it, you could change your mind, okay? And even if you progress through the first year, it's usually possible to swap between them as long as you can catch up the units that you've missed. That's in terms of swapping in between these various programs. Uh, actually, the bachelors and the MPhys are identical for the first two years. So you can swap between them until the end of two years. In fact, what we do is at the end of year two, we write to everybody and say, who wants to be on the bachelors and who wants to be the MPhys? Okay? The only requirement that we have is that to switch to or remain an MPhys, you need to be getting at least 50% in your, in your exams. Okay? So there's lots of flexibility. My advice would be, if you don't know what to put in UCAS form, don't worry about it too much. Okay, make your best guess, and you can always swap when you get arrived here. Okay, it really makes no odds to us at that stage because you're just changing a number on a spreadsheet. Okay. Okay, so uh, in terms of the entry process, uh, our standard offer is two A stars and an A, where the A stars must be in maths and physics, and the A can be in any other subject apart from general studies. Uh, now, we realize that's a high offer. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, because of basically the number of applications that we get. So we get about 1,800 applications for just over 300 places every year. So under the UCAS system, as you may be aware, uh, if a university, any university, makes you an offer of a certain set of grades and you achieve those grades or better, not only will we give you a place? We're actually legally obliged to give you a place. We can't say no, okay? So the only way that we can control numbers is by setting the offer grades. That's our lever, okay? To so make sure that we don't overshoot our capacity. Because there's only so many lecture, places in the lecture theater, there's only so much space in the lab, okay? So the only lever that we have is the offer grade, okay? And we set that from, just from, because it doesn't change that much from year to year, previous experience, we need to have it at that level to make sure that we don't overshoot our capacity, okay? That's because we're applied about six applications for every place, roughly. Uh, so that's our standard offer. Uh, we have contextual offer as well. So that depends on um, people's personal circumstances, things like uh, if you're from a postcode or a school which hasn't in the past sent lots of people to university or if you've been in care for more than three months, things like that. That's all taken into account, and if you tick enough of those boxes, you get a reduced offer, a reduced offer grade, okay, which in the, in the, in the extreme could be as low as three A's. Okay. Uh, that's A-levels. Of course, if you're doing some other uh, qualification, whether it be IB, Scottish Hires, or uh, some overseas qualification, then we will just take the equivalent grade uh, to two A stars in an A. Okay. More details about that can be found on our website. Okay, so that's the, uh, let's imagine that you decide you want to study physics, you decide you want to study physics in Manchester, you get the grades and you come to us, 
what sort of thing can you expect to be taught? How can you expect to be taught uh, when you come to Manchester? Uh, we have a core plus option structure to the degree. So a certain number of key topics that every physicist should know. In fact, they're set out by the Institute of Physics as part of the accreditation process. Okay? But they don't occupy the entire timetable. So there's room to study optional modules, op optional lecture courses. Okay? So bits of physics that you don't have to study, but you want to study because it's of particular interest. Okay? And as I say, one of the benefits of a, being a, from a, coming to a big department is that we have a lot of staff and we can offer a lot of different options. So, uh, this is not a, an exhaustive list by any means, but a level one, two, and three correspond basically level uh, years one, two, and three. So, we've got uh, core courses in all the sort of things you would expect to find in a physics degree dynamics, quantum, relativity, EM, properties of matter, etc. But then you've got options that you choose from this list. So, notice that the number of options increases as you go to later years. That's because you've done the core material by this point, particularly by the time you get to the third year. And so you've got more and more space in your timetable to choose the bits of physics that you're most interested in. Okay, that's years one, two, and three. So that would apply to both MPhys and bachelors. If you're on the MPhys course, so you've got fourth year, actually you've done all the core material by this point. So all the choices are options. Okay. The only compulsory, compulsory element is the fact you've got to do a research project, but the topic of that research project is up to you, okay? your choice. So you do a research project, which is uh, in the first years, one, two, and three, you'll spend your, lab, your time in the teaching labs, and you'll see those on the tour. Okay? But if you're on the MPhys course and you go to the fourth year, you leave the teaching labs and you get embedded into a research group. And there you do a research pro uh, project two days a week for the entire year. You do real research level work in year four. And on top of the research project, you do eight different lecture courses. Okay, they're all options, all, one, all topics you've chosen from this long list. Okay, too long for me to read out now, but as you can see, it spans everything from advanced quantum to galaxy formation. And that's just the options that we offer within physics. You're also able to choose options from other departments. So if you want to, I don't know, study a foreign language or a bit of history or engineering or maths, you can do that as well. Okay, so you have lots of flexibility in choice. Okay, and in year four, it's all choice. Okay, so that's what we teach. So how exactly do we teach it? So uh, it varies as you progress. Um, but to illustrate, uh, I've chosen the first semester for a first year, because that's uh, the first thing you'd be doing if you come to us. So uh, you have uh, a day in lab, okay, in first year. Each experiment you do is two days over two weeks, but each day you have either Monday or Friday in the lab, uh, and that's five hours, okay. And as you'll see when you go on the lab tour, uh, the experiments you do in first year are the shortest ones you'll do, two days. They only get longer after that ending up in a fourth year project that could be 48 days long, okay? Uh, but, so you have five hours on a lab day. Uh, sorry, five hours on a lab day. And then you have five different lecture courses, each of which has two lectures per week. So that's 10 hours of lectures, okay? And on top of that, you get two hours of tutorials. Now, a tutorial, if you're not familiar with it from school, this is when you have four or five uh, students and a member of staff and it's very labor intensive in terms of the teaching but we think it's really important because this is your chance to have those in-depth conversations with a member of staff because you'll be covering some really quite challenging concepts in your lectures even in your first semester you'll be dealing with quantum mechanics and relativity okay these are tricky ideas and we think you really benefit from the chance to talk them over with a member of staff okay so we're keen on tutorials so you have two hours of those in, in your first year. Okay, so that's how we teach, but we also are very keen for you to do as well as you possibly can, okay? To really realize your potential. So we have lots of uh, support networks in place to help you. So first and foremost, actually, is the fact you have your tutorials. That means a regular weekly meeting with a member of staff for an hour uh, and two hours in the first year. So that's the first point of contact. Your tutor might not be able to solve your problem, but at least be able to direct you to someone who can. So that's a very useful support mechanism in itself. 
Um, and in addition to your tutor, you're also allocated an academic advisor. So a tutor will be with you for one year, okay, for one particular year. An academic, academic advisor is there with you for the entire three or four years of your degree program. So they meet with you several times a year to discuss progress, exam results, option choices, things like that, and keep an overall view on how you're progressing. Okay? Uh, we also have a peer assistance uh, program. So basically, when you arrive as a first year, you are allocated a, a buddy, another student in a higher year, who you just someone you can talk to on an informal basis. Maybe it's not something you want to talk to a member of staff about. Maybe you just want to say, oh, I'm not sure about this option, or what's the best experiment to do, or things like that. So just someone you can talk to on an informal basis. And of course, uh, we're a big university. We're very used to supporting people who've got disabilities, whether that be physical or learning disabilities. So for instance, uh, if you need help taking notes, we can have a range of printed notes to be provided, or if you've got dyslexia, you get extra time in the exams. Okay, so we've got a full network and systems in, in place to support everybody to do the best they possibly can uh, during their studies. Okay, so let's imagine that I've persuaded you, right, that physics is the thing to do and, uh, and Manchester is where you want to study it, and you come to us and you have a great time for three or four years studying, and then you graduate. What then? What can you do with a physics degree? Okay. Uh, well, here are a couple of uh, case studies. So these are uh, student, recent students who've graduated and what they've gone on to. So here we have Ellen. Okay, so she's moved, did an MPhys in physics with Astro. Okay, and then now works for Apple. Okay, so here is an example of where someone's using that uh, those numerical skills, that data analysis skills that she developed in the labs doing experiments, and now applying it for a big tech company. Uh, another example, uh, this is Cayman. Uh, he was a student of mine, actually. We did a, he did my uh, final year project. And he's worked, uh, he's now working as an editor for an academic journal. So when you write, uh, uh, when you do an experiment, you write it up, you write it up as a paper, it gets submitted to a journal, and it gets published. So they have editors, and he's working for one of those journals. Okay, so two case studies. But I'm a scientist and I like numbers, right? So here's some numbers. Uh, okay, this is data compared, uh, uh, compiled from the most recent Delhi survey. This is the survey uh, undertaken by the government, which basically surveys all recent graduates and says, what are you doing now? Compiles it for every department uh, in every subject in the country. Okay, so this is the data for us. So I've divided it in different, I've divided it vertically by people doing the bachelors and the MPhys, okay, because they behave, tend to behave a bit differently, and also horizontally by general area of uh, occupation. So the top one is what you might call tech. So we're using not the physics knowledge per se, but rather the skills, okay. And about, as you can see, about uh, nearly a quarter of MPhys do that, and about a sixth of the bachelors go down that route. Uh, sorry, that's a, this is people using knowledge and skills. This is the one where people are using the uh, skills but not the knowledge. So the, we have a large fraction of our students who then go on to work in finance, essentially, using those numerical skills. So you can see, actually, for the bachelor students, it's nearly 40%, uh, a fifth for the MPhys students. And the last category is further training, research and further training. As you can see, the most, uh, biggest fraction of those are people going to do a PhD. So we get some of the most highly achieving students coming to us. It's not surprising that a big fraction of them go on to do a PhD either here or elsewhere. Okay, the other thing I wanted to point you towards was this very interesting study uh, published a few years ago now. By, it was commissioned by the Department of Education but carried out by the Institute of Fiscal Studies. It's a... Uh, well-respected think tank, and the idea was to look at uh, the, cur uh, the connection between undergraduate degree topic and early career earnings. Okay, by early career they mean, uh, in this case, defined as age 29. Uh, so this is the date. Well, there's two slides: one for men, one for women. Uh, they look very similar, though. So you can see, well, basically, you've got uh, degree subjects along the bottom, and you've got average earnings age 29 on that way. And notice this is the, uh, the done in order. This is the high, high earning end, 
And it's got some things there you, you won't be surprised to see, things like medicine and law, but look at the other subjects, economics, maths, physics. The common connection between them is numbers, numeracy, analysis, okay? Though demonstrates the demand in the job market for people with those skills. So the message on the other, and the data for women looks very similar. In fact, actually physics is, is even higher up, but the, the picture's the same, okay? Uh, this demonstrates that if you've got a degree, like physics, where you become highly numerate and good at analysis, then you have skills that are in demand and that the job market is willing to pay for. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, we don't just, when you graduate, we don't just say, well done, goodbye, ta-ra, good luck. We actually support you as well, okay? You're supported by the career service for two years after graduation, okay, to make that transition in, in, into work. So all these services that are offered to uh, both our current students and graduates for two years, okay, that allow you to make the best of all job opportunities. So we prepare you, help you prepare for your interviews, help you uh, research employers, etc., etc. Okay. So let's summarize uh, what I've been saying. Physics at university is extremely broad in its scope. Okay? It covers everything, literally everything, in terms of studying the universe as a whole. And at all possible scales less than that, from galaxies and planets and stars down to fundamental particles, the very building blocks of the universe. And it's not just an understanding that we seek of the universe, but we need to know how to use that understanding to do useful things, to make new technologies. Okay? And in learning how to do, uh, to do physics, you learn a set of very useful and saleable skills, okay? becoming highly numerate and analytical, and you have uh, develop a very robust and rigorous way of thinking. All those means that you have lots of options in the job market when you graduate, okay, and you can physicists command some of the highest salaries out there. Okay, so that's ba almost all I've got to say. I just want to flag up that you've heard me speak, okay, uh, for, for the last 45 minutes or something. You may also want to talk to a current student. Now, there are two ways of doing that. If you go on the lab tours uh, that are running all day, they are, uh, you'll be taken around the building by some of our current students, okay? Uh, student ambassadors. So you can see the labs, but you can also have a chance to chat with some current students, okay? Uh, you can also do it, if you don't mind to do that today, you can also do it via our website. We have this uh, uh, chat facility, okay? It's like a WhatsApp sort of chat thing. So you can actually talk uh, that way to one of our current students if you want to know anything about what it's like to do a physics program here in Manchester from their perspective. Okay, uh, I'm going to take questions in a moment, both uh, asking them from the audience and I'll hang out at the bottom here for a while afterwards if you want to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. We've also got the physics stand up in the Shuster building, the main lobby, where, we, uh, where you can come and ask questions that you might have. Okay, if the question you want to ask only occurs to you on the train home today. Don't worry about it. With other ways, you can get an answer. You can just look on the website or email us, okay? And we'll try our best to answer any questions you might have, okay? Or, or look at any of the social media uh, channels. Okay, so that's uh, all I had to say. So now uh, I'll take any questions that people might have. Uh, Yes. So, um, to do research, all, most of our research is actually funded by government or companies. Okay. So, uh, we, particularly if you do the uh, fourth year MPhys and you, when you do your project, you'll be working in a group who will basically be funded either by the government or companies or a combination. Of of them both, yeah. There's also got the, if you're interested in industrial sort of experience, we also have the scope to do a placement year, okay? You can interrupt your studies and go and work 
uh, uh, do a placement for a year and resume your studies uh, after that. Yes? Uh, no, no. We, when we look at offers, right, we're looking for three A levels or the equivalent if you're doing some other type of exam, okay? We look at physics, we look at maths, and a third A level. If you're doing four A levels, right, we will take the best of your other two, physics, maths, and the best of the other two. Yeah? Yes? Uh, <laughs> Uh, don't know off the top of my head. It's not a huge, it's not, we don't assume it, if, that, if that's the context, subtext of the question. So we, we require you to have A-level maths, uh, but not further maths. So we don't assume that you know that. In fact, uh, in our first year, we have two maths courses that run, which make sure that everybody's got the, the maths they need to do the rest of the course. Yeah, so we only assume A-level maths. Uh, right at the back. Right back. Yes, yes. So basically, if you apply and your predicted grades that match our offer grades, we will invite you for interview. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So, I, I apologise. I'll get my order wrong. So can the lady? You already asked. I'll ask. Come to you a second. Um, what's your percentage of girls? Uh, it's about twenty-five percent. Okay, that is actually slightly more than the percentage taken A-level physics. So that's the pool we're drawing for, from, and so it'd be, it's tricky to go higher than that, but that's basically cool. Sorry, down. No, we, we, uh, the, the selection process is basically through your predicted grades and, and the interview. Yes? Okay, um, it varies from year to year. It's been fluctuating with Brexit and pandemics recently, but for instance, last year, uh, it was about 12%. Yeah. Uh, yes? Uh, that actually gets so, um, we get about 1,800 applications, and we take on, or our target is 330, so thereabouts. So it's not quite one in six. I missed anybody? Oh, sorry. So, um, you always do lab in a pair. Yeah, the lab is always done in twos. Okay. Tutorials are groups of four and five. Yeah. Um, and then the other major thing is exams, obviously, they're individual efforts. Yeah. Uh, so, I'll come to you first. Yeah. So, um, lab is done uh, by interview and then report, okay? Uh, almost all the other lecture courses are, are done by formal exam in either January or May, June. Uh, there's one or two exceptions if you're doing coding and that's done the coursework, but it's basically formal exam. Mm. Sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. How much does the state count for the To be honest, you, if you are the captain of a sports team, or you've done Duke of Edinburgh, or you've read the great works of literature, that's great for you as a person. It says very little about your ability to do physics. Yeah? So if, I, if you're looking for me to ask what should I put in my personal statement, I would say just uh, explain why you like physics. No, if you can mention a book you've, you've read, a pop science book about physics, that's great. It gives you a talking point. It's really the predicted grades that are the key, and the interview that are the key elements. Yeah. Is there a large amount of working with students within the course? So there is one unit of computing that everybody does, because it's such a useful skill. Um, but, uh, and so if you're in the lab, you know, and you plot your data, you're likely using a spreadsheet. Um, but it's most of the course, if you like, is, you know, sitting in lectures, understanding the material, working through problems. Okay, so it's not, it's not coding, you know. 
Yes, at the back there. So it's uh, half an hour. Yeah, it's with a member of staff. And basically, they're just trying to judge. They're not going to ask you anything that you won't, someone who's doing their level maths and physics won't know. It'd be something that you've heard about. And it's just a way of just getting some further information about your abilities in maths and physics. Yes. So what, the way we use interview is the following. So if you've predicted grades that are equal to our, or, or better than our offer, then that's the basis in which we'll make you an offer. Now, and if you then get those grades in August, then you've got the place, end of story. But because we can't afford to overshoot, we can't have to have too many people in the course, we tend to aim to undershoot, yeah? So we've got a bit of room Okay, there will be usually uh, places available when we've accepted everybody who's made their offer, right? And we will try and take as many people who have missed out by their offer, typically by a grade, as we can. There will be, typically, more of those than there are places left. And then we look at the, the interview. Yeah. Yes, uh, Lady Blue. Yes, yes. So yes, there was, yes, we have an industrial placement which basically allows you to interrupt uh, your degree programme and we help you arrange the placement. Yeah, but basically, if you're doing a BSc, you'd have uh, a year inserted, if you like, between years two and three, so your total time would be four years, but the third year would now be in industry, and if it's MPhys, it would be either between years two and three or three and four. Yeah. Below. Yeah. Uh, can you give us an example of the PhD research? Yeah, okay, sure. Um, so we're a big department, 90 staff, so we cover lots of things. Probably the biggest department's groups, research groups, are astrophysics. So Jodrell Bank, for instance, is part of our um, department. So we have lots of activity in terms of radio astronomy, optical astronomy, exoplanets, stuff like that. Particle physics is a big group. Uh, so a lot of those people work out at CERN, do the research at CERN. Uh, condensed matter, so that includes things like graphene. So obviously graphene's a big area in Manchester, so we've got lots of people working on that. We've got nuclear physics, biophysics, photon physics, uh, nonlinear physics. Uh, yeah, I think that covers all of it, yeah. So that, basically it's a big department with lots of diverse uh, research interests. Yes. So the research uh, projects are, form an integral part of the fourth year. So you're spending two days a week, as timetabled, working in a research group. So, so if I go back, can I go back? This guy here, Cayman, he worked with me actually. Um, so he spent two days a week with a, with a partner uh, in, in my lab. And we actually, uh, that picture was taken at a, a conference he went to based on the work he did, and we actually published a paper together. So, uh, yeah, but it's built into the fourth year. We also have uh, internship programs that you can apply to for the summer, for, uh, in, in earlier years, if people are interested. It's not compulsory, not part of the program, it's just if people are interested. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. General Applied Physics 2021, 20, look it up. Came in Greek, cool degree, as, as an author, as an author. Not, not, I'm not saying every project ends up in a paper, but sometimes you do. Yeah. If, it, if it ends with that, then there's a, a credit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, behind. How much um, extra work on top of the contact hours is expected? Okay, so the 17, typically say 17 hours of contact time. So you're actually being actively being taught in person in the room. Okay, and then on top of that, you've got to do, each lecture course will have uh, question sheets, problem sheets associated with it. 
and then we encourage people obviously to you know read over the notes carefully uh, and then lab you obviously time the lab but then you also got to do write up lab reports and things like that and prepare for uh, interviews so it's basically a full week's worth of learning with exceptions we always leave wednesday afternoons free wednesday afternoon the same across all whole university is that's the time that's left free for sports clubs student union activities things like that so it just allows you to get involved in that side of things as well yes uh, yes well it depends how far you've gone down the track yeah if you certainly in the first year you can catch up the units you've me uh, missed beyond that uh, it's a bit tricky because you need to do certain number of units to qualify with a physics degree so if you've missed too many then it's not possible to catch up at the back. Yeah, there is. So uh, you, there's a certain amount of physics you want to do in each year, uh, but then you've got option choices, and you're free to take some of those options outside of physics. So you want to do engineering, or a, you want to learn how to speak German or something, or Japanese, then you can use some of your option choices to do that as well. Yes. So, um, no, we, the, the, the offer is A stars in maths and physics and the A in the third subject. I, said, I can't see any other hands. You need to, if you are, hold your hand up and wave more vigorously. It was that killer last question, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or stunned in silence. No, we're all very impressed that these are A star students in the audience today. Yes. So, oh, one more. Yeah. Are they kind of static or is it so we, no, we have uh, fixed partnerships because the idea is that when you go abroad in year three, you're studying physics in that language, but we have to make sure that you're studying the right physics so it, so it sort of integrates with our program. You can't end up missing bits. So we have established collaborations or partner universities. So uh, it's Munich and Berlin in Germany, uh, Madrid in Spain, Trieste in Italy, and there's two in Paris. I forget which one is Paris 6, I think, one of them. So you need the language, basically. So what we do is, in the, it's in year three. In years one and two, we give you an assessment when you arrive and say what level your language is, and then we design the language learning course. So you have to use some of your options to study French or German or Spanish to make sure that end of year two, you're ready to go and learn physics at university in a foreign language. And the other thing we do is because the la that language tuition is given by the language schools, but obviously they don't know the physics terms. So in second year, we also give you a tutorial by uh, a member of staff who happens to be a native speaker of French or German or Spanish. So you get to know all the physics terms and that sets you up for year three. Yes. So, um, if you go to the physics department, you can see your uh, lecture theatres, but in a core course in first year, it will be uh, not quite everybody who's at different degree programmes, but, you know, 280 people, right? That's a core course. As you go to later years, you have more and more options, and options, not everybody will do them. Yeah, so they can be uh, a lot smaller. By the time of fourth year, it might be 30 people in a particular option. Yeah. No, nope, I. Oh no, no, no. Sorry, we're just scratching nose. <laughs> okay, so I hope that was useful. You know, like I said at the beginning, this process is all about helping you. You know, giving you information to make a really difficult and personal and important decision. Right, uh, it's a start of a process. You know, you probably won't be applying until next autumn, uh, but. You know, I hope this was useful, but also please make use of the lab tours to get a feel for what they look like, and also if you get a chance to talk to our, talk to our students. I'm going to stay here for a bit, in case anybody wants to ask me a questions one-to-one. -one. The stand in the Shuster lobby will be running all day, if you want to talk to one-to-one -to -one there as well. Uh, and obviously, uh, there'll be um, 
opportunity to talk via email or through the website if you've got any questions that way. Okay, thanks for your time. I hope that was useful. If you can uh, exit on at the front, left and right. Thank you very much.